So before we start, I'll just give a brief introduction to the Local Government Capacity Centre and a run over the timetable for today's event. So this summer learning programme is brought to you by Homes England's new Local Government Capacity Centre. This summarises who we are and what we do. So the Local Government Capacity Centre develops, curates and designed well-structured accessible offers for local government with the aim of increasing capacity and skills to make homes happen in the short, medium and long term. We are starting small, but we do have a lot more to come. So quickly, just to run through the agenda for today, we will start with an introduction to um, key project management principles led by Ian and Ken, two of our project directors. We'll then move into two breakout groups where Mike and Ken will talk about their experiences working on North Stowe and Burgess Hill. And they will also be able to take questions you may have in those groups. At 12 p.m. we'll resume to the main room and we'll hear from Catherine Holmes, one of our heads in Market Partners and Places Directorate. And we're also joined by Juliet Blackburn today from Wirral Borough Council and we'll hear about their experiences on World Left Bank. So Ian, over to you. Thanks, Rebecca. So I've turned my camera on, so hopefully you can see me. Um, one of the things I think probably I, I'd like to stress in all of this um, at the beginning in terms of project management is project management can be a very technical feasible um, and uh, structured, process however a lot of project management is about people it's about how you are it's about how you work it's about your values and your behaviors and so a lot of that team working is is absolutely critical so i think that's a, a theme that runs through a lot of all of this uh, next slide please i am starting to sound like chris witty brilliant um so a lot of this uh, my part of this and Ken will follow on is is clearly the session around um, teaching you how to suck eggs uh, in some respects. But however, what uh, is best to set this context out, I, uh, I think um, what we are really here to do is to engage with you to help. And probably I think the sessions of the breakout sessions of sharing our experience with you is 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 fundamentally incredibly important. And um, typically, as it says there, People will, in the context, will look at portfolio, program and project management. Um, how do I always look at these? Well, I look at a portfolio as being a series of programs and I look at a program as being a series of projects. Um, as I've said earlier, project management really is, is very much about organisation. It is about how do you react to situations? How do you manage resources? It says there, um, and clearly there are a number of parameters in there that you have to look through at all time and keep coming back to. I think the vision of what you originally tried to set out is absolutely critical. Keep coming back to what you're trying to do. Personally, I'm a form follows function person, so I tend to try and work out what it is we're trying to do before we look what it looks like. Um, but I do think that, you know, the Prince quote, the Prince quote, they're not Prince as in formerly known as, but Prince 2 and Prince methodologies is a, is a very interesting one, is, is a temporary undertaking that is created for the purpose of delivering one or more business products according to an agreed business case. Absolutely in function terms, purely it is, but also it is incredibly much more complicated than that. But you have to keep coming back to some form of organisational process, which then will not only help you to evaluate what you're doing, but it will also keep others contented as to what you're doing, as to where you're going and how the, the vision is being achieved. Next slide, please. So here we go. Let's let's um, look through the principles um, and these are fairly standard and would be as you would expect. Um, I think genuinely a lot of people in defining the project detail aims and activities don't spend as much time as they should do in doing this. But it is absolutely critical to to understand what it is you're trying to achieve, why you're doing it and what does it mean by setting off on that journey and clearly involving the right people. Um, absolutely. I think I have in my life um, and in my career both worked in private and public sector 
I, I've been a director of local government. One of the things I've seen often is, uh, especially in, in, in the public sector, not involving the people such as legal, finance, audit, others that will have a say at some point during the line can cost you both in terms of time or um, resource as we see in the in the bottom so as the next point estimating the resource the times and the costs get this work done very quickly very early on but do it in some way that isn't just finger in the air that actually is based on um what you think at this current moment in time will be the estimation but if you've got the right people involved and you've defined the project you're in a much better space to understand all of that Break the project into manageable sections. Absolutely. Uh, these are fundamental to do, but I also think you have to continue to come back to the bigger vision as well as to making sure those manageable sections are not disconnected from what you're trying to do. Um, in our world, in the public sector, how will finance be managed? Understanding those finance people's requirements, understanding what you need to do in terms of reporting, um, and it comes back to involving those right people. Get those right people in the, around the table at the beginning and understand what it is they want and how you have to manage that finances. Because clearly you will be and we are all under, you know, the rules and regulations, but you will very quickly, I find if you if you start straying away, there will be people that will be asking questions. Why are you doing that? Have you got the delegated authority to do that? Define how change and risk will be managed. Absolutely. I think one of the things, and I, I use this as a, um, in fact, I had a call on it only last Friday. People, if we're not careful, we can we can set out risk registers, we can set out processes for managing risk, but it's actually how you do that. How do you mitigate it? How do you demonstrate it? And how do you identify it very, very early on? Um, a friend of mine once said to me, whilst we were talking about RAG rating, he said, have you heard of the project, the public sector? Um, rag rating called watermelon. I said no. He said, well, it's green on the outside, but it's red in the middle. And I think that is exactly how we need to avoid that. The, I personally have said to people, I don't like green. I like red and I like amber because I know things are going on. I'm not convinced green is, is a good thing to do until the risk has disappeared. And uh, six months down the line, everybody is happy. Then I'm probably somebody who wants to turn it green. Um, Clearly closing the project off, uh, a lot of things happen where we we don't do this correctly or we haven't outlined how that is going to happen in the first bit, but the evaluation of what lessons learn. You can do that with a lip service to say, yes, we've done that, but actually best management, best organisations, best structures I've ever worked in do genuinely take those lessons learned, review them and include them into their into their next project so that you don't just have a piece of paper at the end of it. Next slide, please. So looking through all of this, how do you actually do it? Um, as we've talked about, absolutely defining that project. What is it? What are you trying to do? But what are the deliverables that come out of it that make it up? One of the things, if you're not careful in our world, is you have policy people and you have delivery people. Um, you have to make sure that the policy people don't create a policy that is not deliverable, but equally that the delivery people don't deliver something that has got nothing to do with the project or the policy that it was trying to overcome. So understanding that at the beginning, understanding what the risks are and what are the issues, what are you going to face? Clearly how we do process the why. So what is the valid business case? Is it still what you're doing? Can you refer back to it? Who signed it off? How is it being delivered? Do you need to refresh it? So the when. Often we get pushed into some interesting timescales um, and I think people can be very unrealistic, especially where there are funding streams attached. You and me as project deliverers, we need to really fundamentally understand the timescales we think it's going to take to deliver. So how do we alert people? How do we say to them and be honest and upfront and say, yeah, I know you want it in six months, but it's probably going to take nine. Let's start that conversation early on in your definitions of when and how you're going to do it. How do you do that? Well, get the right people around you as well that people will be telling you, mm, OK, 
I don't think you're going to be able to do it in that. But also be not af afraid to challenge that, to be saying, OK, but if I have got to get in through six months, what what do we do about that? So there's a there's a bit of a quid pro quo in all of those things. So how do you do it? How will you deliver the project and keep people informed? Understand that that's a fundamental, I think, of, of all the pro public sector project work that we do. You have to make sure you take people with you. You have to make sure that you understand their issues with what you're doing. There's no sole traders really in project management. You've got to be in keeping people involved. So how you communicate that um, and what are their requirements as well as your own. And, and clearly <laughs> when you can do, you know, the achievements, welcome them, tell people about what's going on. Um, where so where is the project what will it impact understanding actually those impacts on on policy on deliverability but also on on the ground on people project management as i said is a lot about people and um, not just fundamentally about the project what is the impacts how are you going to address those so in the key principles at the beginning understanding very quickly who is responsible for which bit which bits and what is being done by others, especially understanding their critical paths, their timescales, their governance. So these are all the things in terms of defining the project detail that you really need to be clear about. Um, and so I, I think it is a really good little checklist to sort of have by your side just at the beginning when you're starting to think all of this through. Next slide, please. So as I've said, involving the right people, absolutely critical fundamentally understanding your governance, fundamentally saying, OK, who is the designated senior responsible owner of this? Who is the officer? Who is the person that is going to be um, responsible for decision making? How do you feed them? How do you show them what it is you require? How can you get them involved right at the beginning in sort of understanding the project detail, but also looking and saying how am i going to work with these people going forward and um, personally as somebody that sits has probably sat in all sorts of all of those four so i've sat on a board i've sat as the sro i have been the project manager i've been part of project teams no surprises please tell me early on if something's not going quite the right way you want it to do but also understand what i'm doing what the team are doing what our other work involvement is because getting that involvement, getting that good relationship at the beginning. And especially as the third point says there, if you're involving third parties inside or even outside of your organization, understanding them and what they do and what they have to go through is, is critical because the last thing anybody wants is to make bad decisions in very difficult, limited timescales. So I think, you know, setting out as it says there all the roles and responsibilities the workshop the potential of that getting good project initiation documentation getting everybody to understand where we're going is is something that you really need to put in and spend the time doing before you get into actually r running the scheme as fast as you may have to putting those early stages in is really really important next slide please and clearly for all of us, but this works in both public and private sector, understanding what is it you actually need in terms of time? What is it you're going to have to spend money on in terms of understanding the cost of it? And what are you going to be delivering in the quality of, of the whole of the project? Inextricably linked. Um, often, as it says there, there is there can be a complete tension in this and sometimes working in the public sector, you'll get a political influence or something that comes through and says, OK, this needs changing. We've got to do this. We've got to do it. being adaptable to those. But if you've got a fundamental understanding at the beginning of what you think is a realistic timescale, a realistic amount of funding or the cost that you're going to do um, and what is the quality that you will be delivering and, and how do you ensure that that continues to come through all the way through you? you have to understand this right at the beginning but being brutally honest these are the bits where you're going to have to change there are things that come in and will change the way you look at time cost and quality i think coming back to the vision of what you want to achieve defining that project will allow you to flex some of this but for me personally 
the biggest one in this uh, is quality, uh, understanding that of what you're trying to set out with. Then the next one, I suppose, for me is cost um, and time. But clearly the balance in between all that is, is a difficult one to do. Next slide, please. So I think this is at the point where I will hand over to my erstwhile colleague, Mr. Ken Glendenning, who will uh, take us through from here. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, Ian. Um, yeah, so good morning. My name is Ken Glendening, also a project director at uh, Homes England. Uh, I'll take for the next few slides. So picking up on what uh, Ian's just been uh, uh, talking through. Uh, the next stage is breaking the project down into manageable sections, really. Uh, so uh, the first bullet point, a plan will provide a route map and must be flexible. Well, this is critical, really. If we set up the project correctly, then we have effectively a business case, a business plan that uh, will enable us to have a strategic overview of where we're going and what this project is intending to deliver. Now, for it to be successful, it will need to be regularly reviewed and updated, and that's an ongoing process, whether that's through the governance that you've put in place, whether that's through uh, the key milestones that I'll come on to talk about in a second, but clearly there's a review process to make sure that the, the plan that you've structured, the plan that you've put in place is going according uh, to uh, the sign off that you now have uh, to take forward. So uh, the key milestones really, well, they flow out of the governance process that you have. They set the milestones of the project and those might be well, um, those might be set at different levels. They might be at a planning level. They might be at a strategic come from the board in terms of their expectations, in terms of when the project will deliver and that each stage it's going through. It might be driven at a programme level. It might be at a particular stakeholder relationship level. So it might be linked to their particular programmes or it might be a project one in terms of uh, an incremental delivery of a particular phase. So key milestones will drive the reporting, but also the governance of the project. What flows out of that are individual tasks and um, the it's important to have a project execution plan in place after approval and that will set out the key tasks and how those need to be completed in order to deliver the project's objectives and outcomes. Now you might find that uh, it's helpful to have a benefits realisation strategy in place. Uh, well, what's one of those? Well, it identifies, is, identifies, and identifies the programme and infrastructure level unique uh, characteristics of the project and the tasks associated with that, right through from the initiation of the project uh, through to the different levels of conceptual to, through to planning stages, uh, the tasks associated bring, with bringing those forward to each of the particular sub phases that flow from that. So really it's so important to get your project plan in draft uh, before you get approval. And then when you've got that approval in place to take forward and the governance is in place to have a, a fully uh, prepared and signed off project execution plan that is regularly reviewed to make sure it's delivering the project objectives. And flowing from that, identifying the particular tasks and how those tasks will be done. Now, this might be done through a project board at a project level, or it might be um, the, uh, the governance that you have in place, the reporting up to a particular board or committee or to some stake stakeholder environment. So it's really important you identify those tasks, when they will be done, how those, how those will be reported through. Uh, next slide, please. So next key stage on, um, as uh, Ian uh, set out in previous slides, how uh, agree how the finance will be managed. Now this is key to a project's delivery, particularly in terms of developing time and the cost profiles before the project uh, before the project manager for the delivery stage is even engaged. So it's important that this process identifies the key project estimates that are documented and the assumptions underwriting that. 
So bring together a team. It might be at a workshop. It might be at a very high level, but identify the cost assumptions and the estimates that flow into delivering the project and set those out at an early stage. If there's going to be a period of iteration, refinement and review as you go forward into the project, but those first assumptions are so critical in terms of developing what is effectively the, the overall envelope of a project and how it will move forward. Now, at, the, at various stages, the estimate uh, will be the most accurate uh, based upon the information you have at a time. And as uh, Ian said, bringing the team together, bringing the right level of resources, the right skills together will help to refine that, whether you're using an external cost consultant, whether you're working with partners, it, you've got to rely upon your team to give you the best information and therefore they can give you a defensible figure at each stage. Now clearly as you move forward in a particular project or program, then those estimates can move towards more fixed costs and therefore when you start tendering things, uh, tendering particular work streams, then those uh, projects can then start to work to uh, quite specific figures. But Make sure that you've got sufficient allowance within your estimate to uh, get what you feel at each stage is the most defensible figure. The next stage is uh, looking at uh, the uh, purely internal resource. Now you might find that you're not actually at that stage where the project is bringing in external parties. You're using a lot of external uh, colleagues, uh, sorry, internal colleagues to develop a project. Well, that's great. I think that you've got to use the best resources around you and what that means uh, in terms of refinement. Don't forget that that resource is perhaps time intensive, so you will be taking those colleagues away from other projects. So you've got to make best use of their time and therefore use of their knowledge in order to refine it. And that's sometimes where sort of task and finish workshops where you can dedicate an amount of time to a particular uh, work stream to get an out term is sometimes really helpful. So estimates need to be as precise as possible given the stage of project development and as you move forward, you move from estimates perhaps through to a tendering process, through to more fixed costs, but ultimately uh, they will be refined and there will be a, a whole process associated with reviewing that alongside the project execution plan. Now the table on the side of the slide there, now top down estimates, those are at an early stage based upon limited information, Bottom-up estimating is where you start to look at um, how you deliver each strand and perhaps draw together uh, different levels of information to uh, uh, in inform an overall estimate. So that's drawing information from other projects, um, other resources and uh, other influencers as well. So uh, next slide, please. So defining how the risk and management uh, will change. So this is the uh, next stage of this. It's a risk management plan as such. And as you can see, uh, why risks? Well, I think every time you take on a project, it is always risky and it's a part of the project manager's role to manage that risk uh, transparently and openly. So looking at those sort of four boxes on the uh, right hand side, it's really important to identify what your risks are that could occur as part of a future or positively ne negatively impacting on a program or project. So spend some time uh, identifying those risks. Um, it might be that you plan carefully defining what those are and defining what those risks could be, capturing what those uh, risks might be before they happen, quantifying then and then, then assessing uh, what those risks will be and potential of their impact, and then ultimately addressing through a series of activities what you'll be doing in terms of uh, assessing what actions and mitigations will be taking, taken to uh, identify what that risk could be, um, and how you will manage it. And then finally moving into the monitoring stage of it, that's monitoring the risk and, uh, until it realises in a controlled way or until it is no longer a threat and therefore adjusting the strategy as necessary. So each of these four stages from identifying through to assessing, through to addressing, mitigating, and then finally more monitoring and reporting will be part of a key activity of a project manager will take on 
particularly in major projects where there's financial allowances for contingency, it's important that those are very transparently uh, audited each uh, month or week, depending on the scale and complexity of your particular project, and assessing their impact on the contingency on the project, on the overall program, and therefore the risk of delivering the outcomes uh, as well as the uh, key key tasks. So all of these flow together. So it's really important to put together a key early stage risk uh, template um, at uh, different levels, whether it be a program level, whether it be if you're delivering infrastructure level, and then ultimately at project level. So different levels of project risk assessment, all of them flowing through to reporting back into a governance process. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is um, the uh, final uh, slide on this section, really, and I think this sort of you will see this as the end of the project of an evaluation process where you have to assess the overall achievements of the project. Now you started back at the beginning in terms of setting out the business case and its overall objectives. What is it achieved against those objectives? Has it met those objectives? Has it uh, delivered overall value for money uh, in terms of the original scope? Um, and uh, lessons learned from the project. Now you might do these all the way through, through different work streams, or you might do it at the end, depending on the scale and complexity of your particular project. But key lessons learned are so important to inform future projects, but also uh, what you've done well on the project and what you can learn from it. And you draw those findings together uh, as evidence and analysing them and make sure that those are reported up uh, so that uh, the governance process that you have in place. So it's an effective evaluation that sets out the best principles of your decision making and lessons learned through the lifetime of the project. And now I'm going to hand to Mike to introduce the uh, next section. OK, thanks. Uh, thanks, Ken, and thanks, Ian. That was uh, that was great. Thank you. So we're just going to move into uh, a couple of breakout groups now uh, to look at how those project management principles are put into practice against a couple of projects. So Ken will be leading one session looking at Burgess Hill, and I'll be taking the other session looking at North Stowe. So, uh, it's a 30 minute session. There'll be sort of 15 minutes where we'll talk through the project, the key challenges, uh, solutions that we have implemented and lessons learned. And uh, then we'll come back uh, as one at 12 o'clock. So um, if you could work your IT magic and put us into these breakout rooms, please. Thank you. Uh, we're leading the development uh, through, so it's, a, it's two developers involved, us and uh, L&Q, and we're delivering 7,500 of the 10,000 homes. Next slide, please. So just to give you a flavour of the master plan, as I said, it's being delivered by two, two master developers. Uh, phase one in yellow, uh, 1500 homes being delivered by LNQ Estates. Um, they're halfway through now, they've delivered 700 out of 1500 new homes. Uh, phase two, uh, Homes England has a planning permission and is started to deliver the first of its three and a half thousand homes. And then uh, 3A to the south and 3B to the north. Uh, homes England, uh, we've submitted, prepared and submitted planning applications to the local authority for 5,000 homes, uh, which we're uh, anticipating uh, seeking a resolution to grant this year with uh, a planning consent due next year. Uh, next slide, please. So what is Homes England's role in delivering a project like North Stowe? So again, at the outset, Homes England's role has been as master developer. So basically it's uh, in its simplest form, land assembly, dictating and pulling together the strategy, securing the planning, putting in all the upfront key infrastructure that's needed to deliver this new town uh, and, and setting the parameters for what it wants to deliver. So it's all about placemaking, early delivery of key uh, infrastructure. So for example, we've got a primary school on site, we've got a secondary school already open, and again, we've only got sort of 700 homes on site. 
So it's all about it's all about putting this key infrastructure in and putting it early. We manage the planning, we manage the section 106, we create design codes and we sell service parcels to the development market to deliver at pace. MMC, so big key priority for Homes England is MMC and quality and design. Uh, next slide, please. So as part of as part of uh, our role, we have a full infrastructure and parcel delivery program. It runs for another 20 years, probably a bit more than that. Uh, the whole scheme is fully costed, uh, which I'll come on to. And um, so when we go to government, uh, we can give them the assurance that we've got a plan in place. It's fully costed. We know how we're going to deliver it. Obviously, over 20 years, it won't be delivered like this. There'll be there'll be bumps along the way, which means we have to change strategy. And that's one of the that's one of the keys to project. The project management is is the what if it's the contingency. It's how do we deal with, for example, um, in 2008 when the world fell off a cliff in the credit crisis. Uh, how did we cope with that? So again, you always have to anticipate the uh, the unexpected. Uh, next slide, please. So OK, so <coughs> excuse me, just moving on to uh, those project management principles and how we've put them into a North Stowe context. So it's knowing our role. So as I said, our role is master developer. We're putting in the infrastructure. We have an infrastructure delivery plan. We do the planning. We have a, a project execution plan. Again, key key to setting out key roles and responsibilities at the outset. We have clear milestones and targets, uh, which we have put into our business plan, and our business plan has to be approved by government. Uh, so I'll come on to that in a minute. Governance and reporting is absolutely key. Uh, we have uh, a vast responsibility, we have a vast budget, and we have to ensure that we are acting in accordance with not only um, not only our rules and responsibilities as, as part of Homes England, but within wider government. So we report up to Treasury, we report up to the department on an annual basis, uh, and we report internally on a monthly basis. Just looking at the project principles, involving the right people, they're absolutely key. That's my experience. We have a small project team of eight to 10 people. Each of them is, a, is an expert in their own field. And the way that we've structured our project team is we have uh, those that are experts in planning, those that deliver the technical uh, highways and infrastructure utilities, environmental, property, comms. So we have experts in each of those fields and what we act is is, is as, an, as an informed as an informed client and we do bring in a lot of external support and again it's key to getting the right external report which means that when you write a brief to go and get i don't know um highways consultants for example you know how to put the brief together correctly you know what you want uh, that's key i mean i've i've worked on projects where the brief has not been right you don't get the right people or you don't get the right service. So again, getting the right brief is absolutely key. As I say, we have a small project team on, on the agency side, but across the agency, hundreds of people have been involved in North Stowe, and that's absolutely right. You bring them in as and when needed, legal, finance, risk, uh, all essential to the project. Uh, moving on to finance, how is finance managed? Again, absolutely critical. Uh, I don't, you know, we have a we have a, a financial system at Homes England. I don't mind whether we have three or four or five hundred budget lines, as long as I am able to interpret what we have spent, how we've spent it. That's absolutely key. And we have our we have our finances managed by uh, a particular individual. Uh, I used to manage it, but uh, I've passed that on to somebody else now. And again, I think that's key that that person who 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 acts as like a fulcrum across the team uh, knows exactly what is going on, how the costs were managed, our approvals, how contingency is managed. I think that's something that Ken picked up on is absolutely key. 
you know, the, the government will give us contingency on items. It's not there to spend from day one. We have to be able to manage how we do that. Break the project into manageable sections. I mean, North Stowe, massive project, massive project, and you have to break it into manageable sections to make it work. And I said, as I said earlier, I've broken it into particular specialisms. So planning, property, environment, placemaking, uh, and, and that's the only way that's the way that I, it's not saying it's the only way, it's the way that I have broken the project down into those manageable sections. Change in risk. I don't have a problem with risk as long as we know, as long as we have an appetite for it. As long as it's, as long as we know the implications of, of doing something and we know the risk, then we can assess our appetite for it. Uh, we regularly review risks. We have a monthly risk workshop. And again, we look at them on a sort of macro scale, uh, but we also look at them on on those manageable sections, specialism scale. So, uh, you know, I think we have a reasonable handle on risk, um, but it is important to manage it uh, and manage it frequently. And record lessons learned. I think that's a that's a key one as well. So Ken and I are working on these big projects. We all learn something every day and we we swap, we talk about them section 106s for example um, we have section 106s where eventually we will have many developers working on the same section 106 so it's how how managing risk on that so ken and i can and i swap information and ideas on that and i think that's that's absolutely key uh, next slide please So this is uh, just a slide on lessons learned, really, that I've picked up and put together on on North Stowe over the few years that I've been working on this project. So it's a 20 year project from now and it's been running for 17 years already. So you 30, 30 to 40 year project. You've got to understand those long time scales and what are the implications for it, but you need to adapt to change. As I said, we've put a we've put a cost plan together for this project which lasts the next 10 years. And the one thing I can guarantee you is that that cost plan will not be the cost plan that's delivered. So you need to be adaptable to change. Get the right team in place with the right expertise. Uh, somebody once told me, surround yourself with the best people. Absolutely right. Um, absolutely key. I mean, I've, I've in, a, in a former life, I delivered a road. I'm not an engineer uh, and what a, uh, might have, might have, didn't do the best job, let's put it mildly. So get the right people in place with the right expertise. Engage early with stakeholders. Uh, I, I, we have a very good working relationship with our local authorities uh, in Cambridgeshire and we work hard to maintain it. It's a two way thing. Uh, very important, very important because you will need to work together. Uh, transparency with information. Uh, we put out really detailed technical packs uh, and planning packs with our land disposals, for example, uh, that will ensure the smoothest possible delivery with our developer partners, uh, which is absolutely key. Otherwise, you end up unraveling problems later down the line, which you could avoid if you put the work in up front. Uh, dedicated in-house experts I've talked about. Project meetings on a two weekly basis. I think uh, good communication is absolutely vital. And I think uh, Ken and Ian summed that up. It's communication and people, and that's what it's about. Uh, so we held, we held full and open, uh, quite long lengthy project meetings every fortnight to make sure everybody knows what everybody else is doing. Uh, learn from best practice, absolutely key. Uh, share experiences, nobody knows everything. There's always something to learn. And the last one was a, well, one I threw in at the last minute was maintain good records. I mean, how many times have we picked up a project from other people to find that you look on the on the um, the IT system to find that you can't find anything or it's in the wrong place? And I really just think having picked up North Stow several years ago and, you know, it, it had its own sort of unique filing system, for want of a better word. Could I find anything? Not really. Um, and again, so but but the project it's a long project. People come and go, so please maintain good good records. So out of that, good communication, teamwork, people are the key ones for me. So 
Uh, I'm happy to take any questions if anybody's put anything in the chat. Sarah. Thanks, Mike. It's Victoria here, actually. I've, I've just, yeah, I've just had a little look um, at the, the questions. There's the first one, just out of interest. Will the different parts of this new town be designed to meet the 20 minute neighbourhood principles linking to project management? How would such a new principle be incorporated? Would this be a major or minor change to the project? Sorry, can you say that again, Victoria? You went in and out. Oh, right. Sorry. So will the different parts of this new town be designed to meet the 20 minute neighbourhood principles? We'll start with that, that first bit. Um, so, so yes, as far as I'm, yes, as far as I'm aware and as far as we can do, absolutely. Brilliant. And then um, he's added linking to project management. How would such a new principle be incorporated? Would this be a major or minor change to the project? So since we are, since we are halfway through, I think it will be I think it will be quite a major thing, but it's something that is certainly on the radar of uh, my planning design and project managers are working towards. And we also have to work with uh, others in different organizations as well. Brilliant, thank you. So we've got um, another question here. What was the key information for the land disposals? I think she means what key information do we put out to developers to adhere to in order to, in order for the developer partners to work up their scheme? Brilliant, that sounds about right. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> so so we, we set it out in a planning context. Uh, so, um, so in the so sorry, let me just go back to the thing. So yeah, so we set it out in the planning context. We have a design code. The design code, for example, will say it's an urban area or a or, or a edge of urban or it's a rural area. So we 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 set out the design code, the elements, the areas of the design code that we are relevant to that particular parcel. We set out the planning framework in relation to that parcel. We set out section 106 requirements for that parcel and which ones Homes England are going to do and any that the developer are going to do. We set out the time scales that we want them to deliver to. We set out, for example, what we think the capacity of that particular parcel is going to be. We set out what we think should be the um, private private housing to affordable housing, parking ratio. As much information as you can set out there, it, it, I mean, it, one you don't get a bid that you don't expect or you don't you don't really want you're actually giving the developer all the information they need to put a uh, a bid submission back to you that as long as it fulfills the price non-price criteria you, you would find acceptable brilliant thank you okay so then we've got a question from nicola who's asked who will be build the houses infra and infrastructure and how will Homes England work with them to deliver this? So on the infrastructure, so Homes England has already let its first significant infrastructure contract. So we're we're just coming to the end of 70 and a half million pounds of infrastructure contract, which is putting in the primary infrastructure to open up the site. We then we then um, in parallel with that deliver service land parcels to the developer market. Now we do that. We can either do that in one of two ways. We can either do that through our developer partner panel, which is due to change in September to a um, to a slightly different system, but you don't have to sign up to the panel for four years. Uh, it's much more dynamic than that. Uh, alternatively, we could go out to OGU. Um, what Homes England seeks to do is, uh, whilst it recognises there's a there's a very de definite place for the sort of top six or seven major house builders, but it also seeks to encourage SME developers as well. So, for example, uh, I know on uh, one of my colleagues' uh, developments, we put the project out with an obligation on a developer to to uh, subsell part to an SME to deliver. So we encourage, we try to encourage developers from all ends. 
Great, thank you. So we've got um, another question. Do you have any tips for managing compliance with planning obligations from a single Section 106 agreement with multiple developers? And do I have any tips? <laughs> um, so in our role as master developer on these large sites, it is Homes England that takes on the Section 106 obligations. And it does that it does that to ensure that developers then are free to develop out without reliance on other developers delivering their elements of section 106. So for example, you know, we make financial payments where they're due uh, or we undertake, I'm just trying to think of an example. So for example, building a community center or something, Homes England will often take the lead on something like that rather than leave it to a third party developer. Uh, if we left it to a third party developer and for whatever reason they didn't deliver it then you know the local authority potentially then could um, issue a stop notice or something on the development until that's key so we try and take reliance between developers out of the equation to ensure smooth delivery brilliant okay um, so we've got one last question, but we do still have a few more minutes. So if anybody does have a question they'd like to have asked, um, please pop it in the chat. But for now, let's have a look at Peter's question. Peter said, many developers talk about doing high quality housing design, but when it comes to detailed applications, they do the minimum, i.e. they meet building regs and reference viability as the reason. How are Homes England different? And do they accept a lower return on land in order to pay for above average design quality? OK, so going back to the design code issue, so Homes England negotiate the design code with the local authority and then that becomes embedded within within the planning permission. When we go, when we take a parcel to the market, uh, we ask for part financial, part non-financial information. And anything that doesn't accord with the um, design code does not progress. So it has to it has to comply with the design code. Now we've put we've put in some quite exacting design codes to drive quality, and that's something that we that we can do. And I'll come on to that in a minute. Um, once we have a developer on board, uh, and I fully understand where that person's particularly coming from because developers being developers will try and water down what they're going to deliver. Not all developers, some do. Um, so I put in one of my design team in, I embed them within their the developers design team and he sits on all of their uh, uh, design meetings and uh, to ensure that the reserve matters application accords with expectations. And we also have a contractual obligation within our building leases to sign them off before they get submitted. So, so that ensures uh, a good line of communication and uh, more often than not, we have some really good reserve matters applications. Uh, Homes England does have a dispensation for want of a better word from government that it can request things of additional quality over and above uh, section 106 local authority planning requirements um, if it fulfills other policy requirements it is limited it's not an open-ended thing so we can drive quality whilst not necessarily accepting that you might get the top price for it um, and also our bidding process we have a price non-price uh, um, assessment criteria and um, I think our standard is 70% price, 30% non-price elements but that can vary subject to approvals so if for example on Northstow our first phase quality was probably as important as price if not more um, so we we uh, we sought an approval and we went ahead on a 50-50 price non-price uh, but it did have some pretty key benchmarks that were yes or no and if the answer to that was no then you couldn't go forward into the into the next stage of the bid process okay great thank you 
Um, Madeline's got a question here. Are new affordable homes policies implemented into larger, longer term schemes, i.e. North Stone? And if so, are Homes England looking to introduce first homes to this site? Oh, that's a tricky one. So, um, as a rule, North Star, sorry, Homes England will be looking to introduce first homes on its on its sites, and I think it's going to be uh, mandatory on all sites beyond. I think it's March 2022 that a certain element will be first homes. On this particular scheme, uh, because we have a discounted market sale product of phase two. Uh, delivering 1,400 discounted market sale products. The local authority are very, very keen not to pursue first homes. They're, they just see there'd be such a plethora of discounted market sale products. So they are actually asking us to work to a more uh, traditional, affordable, rented um, uh, and, and intermediate tenure, uh, Section 106 on that. Now, that's not been finalised as yet. But um, certainly across the vast majority of Homes England's projects, they'll be looking to deliver first homes. Great, thank you. Um, I think that might be the last of those those questions. Um, just before um, we move into the the main room, we've got three minutes. I just wondered, you, you do you do talk about um, sharing best practice. Um, yeah. and sharing best practice within Homes England. Have you seen good examples of local authorities sharing best practice with each other and how this, this can be done? Um, yes, I think I think they have. I mean, there was a stage there was a stage a while ago where local authorities, certainly some in the east of England, actually sort of joined services. And uh, um, I'm, I was thinking of, of one in particular, but certainly where I am at the moment in South Cams, South Cams and Cambridge City joined their planning services. And, you know, South Cam so Cambridge City had delivered some very big schemes as well. And so uh, by incorporating what Cambridge City had done with South Cams, I think it's, um, I think it's actually brought some better ideas together and, and people have learned, definitely. Brilliant, fantastic. And then um, I'm just quickly checking to see if anything else has come in. No, nope, we've got two minutes left. Um, you talk about um, sort of good, keeping good record and making sure things are um, handed over because people move on, but the projects continue. Mm -hmm. Can you give us some insights of how you would do a really fantastic handover and, um, and how it's done badly and how it could be done, done really well? I can give you an example of what we what we've just had to go through. So we've just had to put together a business case for Treasury. And this goes back to uh, setting out in our business case to Treasury information that um, on business cases that were submitted back to 2005. You know, and we've gone through three different organizational changes since then. So when they're asking questions like in 2005, um, you had an approval to do X, Y, and Z. Can you and you have to try and demonstrate how you performed against it? Are the records there from 16 years ago? And are they in the right place? The answer to that was no. So we had to do a lot of a lot of background digging and everything. So, you know, for for for, for my mind, it, for my mind, it's absolutely key to 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 keeping to good record keeping. It just needs to be done. And I know that. It's one of those things that you just think, well, I'll save all that and I'll put all those emails back in that folder later. But sometimes they're rather key. And so, um, yeah, it's just lessons learned, isn't it? Absolutely. Thanks, Mike. That was brilliant. Okay. I think we're going to be whizzed over into the main room any minute okay. now. Um, really helpful insights. And thanks to everyone for your questions. Great. Thanks very much. Thank you. Welcome to everybody and um, it's good to have you uh, all on this breakout session. Um, as uh, Mike said, uh, we are um, um, through this session looking at a particular worked example. Um, I've got a, 
a colleague of mine joining on this call uh, who's going to be working some of the slides. Um, great. So um, the breakout session, as I said, dealing with Northern Arc Burgess Hill, we'll have about 15 minutes to uh, go through these slides. Please ask any questions uh, that you might have. Uh, just as a brief overview of the project for those who uh, don't know about it. Uh, the Northern Arc Burgess Hill is a project um, uh, initiated by Homes England. It's uh, the largest uh, intervention. That's whereby the agency stepped in. Um, uh, we've ever done as an agency in England. It comprises three and a half thousand homes. Um, it's an area in West Sussex in the southeast of England. Um, what is it all about? It's delivering these three and a half thousand homes as well as a, a co comprehensive scheme of two primary schools and a secondary school, a mixed use neighbourhoods uh, and more particularly a spine road as well. So a lot about infrastructure uh, to uh, uh, bring forward uh, the uh, each of the phases of the project as well as a range of inf uh, social infrastructure as well. So schools, leisure, community uses and health provision. Um, as well as uh, employment opportunities. So this is a very complex project, but the agency didn't own it from the first stages. It was owned by a series of landowners and promoters, uh, all of which have been working on the project for a number of years. Uh, when the agency stepped in, uh, we, we brought together, uh, well, under uh, my my uh, team was a consultancy team of ACOM, who are more multidisciplinary team of consultants, as well as other property and contractors. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Why would we be working on this project? Well, this is all about uh, the next slide, please. Um, so the Northern Arc faced a number of challenges. Um, it was all about overcoming barriers uh, to delivery, which is why Homes England acquired the land. Um, it had been in multiple ownerships for a number of years um, and those ownerships and promoters had not been able to agree a way of working in terms of its delivery. So it was important that from a first stage we set out the principles of what the local authority were looking to deliver here, which was a mixed use comprehensive housing development, but also facilitated and supported by Homes England uh, as a uh, project lead. We recognised from day one that there was a number of parties who weren't coordinating and working well together. So planning, infrastructure delivery, land acquisition, all of these work streams had to be brought together. and. Um, we made the case to government to say that the agency had a role here, not only in terms of delivering the local authorities' ambitions, but more particularly managing all those project management work streams effectively on time, but also with the emphasis on of acceleration and early delivery. Now, this had been this project had been around for ten years. And um, there was a degree of impatience because the site had just coming forward in terms of a local plan allocation. Um, and therefore, there was a, a huge amount of expectation that this site will be delivered quickly in terms of the, uh, the local authorities' housing trajectory. So we brought together as an agency a number of work streams, including expertise from external consultants. Um, and we took on what was the first time really the agency saw that, which was to uh, deliver a master developer role. And that is a, a complex uh, activity for a public sector body to take, where we take the role of the private sector, manage all the work streams associated with the project, but with the emphasis of delivering what was a partner's uh, ultimate ambitions, which is the early delivery of a, of a major scheme. So uh, next slide, please. So what is Homes England's role as a master developer? So that was set out in the first uh, point was in uh, preparing a business case for approval. And that was this plan that I was talking about just before this session started. So setting out some clear, clear, 
exactly principles of what was our role here in terms of intervention. And the government needed to support that and allocate its resources through Homes England in order for us to take forward this project. So we made the case to government that there was a multi-streamed activity here that could be delivered by the agency, um, securing land control, taking forward planning, bringing together a consultancy team who would facilitate that and the multiple work streams associated with that. We would also recognise that unlocking a site like this meant that uh, we had to deliver and fund a whole series of um, uh, planning and uh, enabling infrastructure. So uh, we recognise that getting those cost estimates right and reasonable because they were going to be challenged by Treasury and by government, uh, and that the, we knew that we would need to be reviewed about those was, was critical for the project. So from the very early stages, I brought together a team that was not only consultants, but also other colleagues from across government who could inform and influence uh, the uh, business case so that it was robust when it went up for approval. And those recognised that uh, the timing and the um, uh, the scale of the risks associated with delivering not only infrastructure, but also the planning of the site. The uh, funding programmes associated with the procurement of that, well, that next, that fourth bullet point was linked to how the business case was um, um, uh, being uh, set out in the business case. So the procurement, the using the right level of uh, public resources at the right time in terms of uh, unlocking the land. Uh, aligning the public, uh, the land interest to secure a uh, the disposals to optimise land value and participation in a comprehensive scheme. That was all to make sure about the phasing of the scheme was working at the correct time. So again, coming back to the tasks and the implementation of the project. Uh, the next stage was that the the role of the agency here as master developer was recognised that we were single public body who were going to lead on a near series of work streams, not only in terms of procurement of new infrastructure, but also bringing forward uh, phases of the site at particular times. Uh, next slide, please. So infrastructure delivery. Um, this is a sub work stream uh, of that, and it was one of the tasks set out in the early plan. It was recognised that we were not just only going to be acquiring the land, we were going to be putting the infrastructure in to bring forward its development. So early infrastructure delivery in terms of the site was critical. So we identified the likely cost of that, the risks associated with that, uh, the planning time frame for uh, bringing forward uh, the uh, uh, the, the delivery of the contractors. So we went through a full open tender process and negotiated uh, a competitive uh, process to uh, deliver those uh, projects. And in the end, on this particular scheme, we, uh, we've got two particular contracts underway, the Eastern Bridge and Link Road, which you've got a, 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 an example of here, as well as the Link, Western Link Road. So in any project, you'll have different types of activity, whether it be planning, whether it be infrastructure delivery, all of those have to be uh, uh, identified and clearly um, allocated within the overall project uh, plan. So um, what does that mean in terms of the solutions implemented here? So picking up on all the points that uh, Ian and I mentioned in the earlier session. So in terms of the project, uh, it's bringing the right people together. So that wasn't just within Homes England, it's bringing the consultancy team, the project planning team, the technical team, the right level of external and internal resourcing together but also working with uh, partners as well in terms of having strong governance and making sure that uh, they, they are part of the process of delivering the project. So external support was critical for us as well as good relationship management. Sorry, can we just go back to that? Thank you. Uh, next one was about estimating the time and resources. As I mentioned earlier, it's, it's so critical here to have a budget set and continually to review that. Uh, for us as an agency, uh, 
We have a lot of evidence which we use from other projects and tenders that we undertake, but also we use multidisciplinary consultants who are also active in the property market and can draw in resources and knowledge to projects. So it's very important to put together a cost report at a very early stage and that underpinned what was became our business plan. And then we've reviewed that once that got signed off on a regular basis to make sure that we were on track. Uh, we have two weekly cost report reviews. In fact, one is taking place this morning, actually, to make sure that we're on target and that any spend is being managed. Next one uh, about the project management of a project like this is that we split it into delivery solutions, uh, delivery roles, sorry. So what is the planning work stream? What's the infrastructure activity, the environmental activities, the property and disposals? Each of them has an allocated team member with each has a specialism in those particular areas and they report back through a governance process through a project board, ultimately through a quarterly review back up to our, our, our relationship back through government. So each of those special, specialisms takes responsibility for each of its work streams um, and is responsible for uh, reporting on its performance against the original objectives. Now, sitting alongside that on a project like this is, is a risk register. Um, we uh, set the project up with initial sort of high level risk register, which we re regularly review. Once we got into the project as part of the project execution plan, we have regular reviews of the project or uh, risk file, which we hold corporately. But also our external consultants have individual risk registers. So, for example, when we let a, con a construction contract, the contractor uh, has a risk register which they report back up to us on, on the sort of sub activities taking place. So it might be that have they uh, agreed the planning conditions to implement? Have they got those signed off? Have they uh, got the various approvals and technical uh, sign off? Each of these is a sub risk of the main risk register, but actually is, is relevant uh, at a, a sub level for the project as well. And finally, uh, lessons learned. Well, on a project as complex and as, as uh, um, significant as uh, Burgess Hill, we undertake a number of lessons learned activities. And uh, we've been doing that not only after we've got planning permission, but after each of the disposals as well. So for example, after each of the phases, uh, we take a we have a lessons learned activity and we're just about to uh, have another lessons learned on the infrastructure contract. So all of the time we try to um, inform what we're doing here by uh, learning and doing it better the next time so that uh, as a project as long and as complex as this, which will probably take another 10 years to complete, we use uh, the best ways in which we can learn from each of these stages to make sure that we don't make the same mistakes, but also we refine it and, and uh, move towards uh, the greater level of success in the future. So that's a sort of a, a brief canter through the Northern Art Project, and I hope that's full informative to you. Um, uh, so uh, I've got, um, I think I've got Louisa. Have I got Louisa on the call, Louisa? Yeah, I'm here. Do you want to just carry through? Because you've led a number of the lessons learned exercises, haven't you? Yeah, sure. Um, right. So, yeah, we um, throughout the process, we do um, lessons learn. And from doing that, we will look at what went well, uh, what obviously we could have improved on. We will look at um, how we've worked specifically in terms of doing disposal work with um, developers. Did we provide them with enough information in terms of the land that they're purchasing? Uh, did we get it right in terms of time scales? How can we improve on procurement? Um, and we just look at every stage of the, the process that we've gone through, whether it be planning, infrastructure delivery and property, and just take a, a sit back and look at that process from start to finish and what we can improve on and we do that by bringing in all of the consultants who also helped through that process um, and asked for their input and then when we then take the forward the next stage of the project for example selling on the next plot of land um, we will take forward those lessons learned um, also with this project being 
such a, a large project and we're acting as master developer for the scheme. We are uh, an exemplar within the agency um, along with the other large sites. So one thing that is key is sharing the experience we've learned through delivery of the project with other team members um, in terms of other similar projects or even smaller scale just so that we can get it right. Um, so I think it's all about learning from each other, sharing best practice. Um, and then you can take it forward um, to, to be more successful in the future. Great, uh, thanks, Louisa. So uh, that's a sort of a sort of a complete arc of a project like uh, Burgess Hill, uh, just to sort of capture all the things that could go on and do go on on a large project. Mm -hmm. So let's uh, just talk about, should we just go back into the slides and just talk about the land assembly? So yeah, we've got a question there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So say something about how you address the la land assembly challenges. So um, on, on this slide here, um, so uh, some of the key challenges was that uh, the site was subdivided. Uh, there was about 17 landowners, all of them um, were in various agreements with the promoters, and um, they. Uh, uh, clearly had an expectation that the planning would crystallise value as well as uh, planning at some stage. The problem was that there wasn't any agreement between each of them. So in terms of uh, uh, addressing those challenges, <coughs> the role of Homes England was to step in to acquire all the land and that meant that we could equalise and um, give each of the landowners an exit strategy from their land at a base value, which uh, reflected planning, but also more particularly uh, gave an opportunity to for the project to move forward, really. So our role was one of brokering, uh, as well as recognising our role here in the future delivery. So we gave confidence to the landowners that we will bring forward a project, but also drive a delivery solution here that would um, uh, unlock uh, the, the, the long term delivery here. Uh, I think we've got another uh, question here. Um, just. Uh, uh, what is the time from planning submission to the actual start on site? Well, from planning submission, uh, we submitted the planning on this site um, in um, December 2018. It was an outline application across the whole site. We then <coughs> secured planning uh, within nine months. The, the, off the back, I think the planning was secured because the local plan was allocating the site, but also more particularly uh, the consultancy team, Homes England, uh, brought in were tasked very early on to meet various milestones on the project and that was to deliver or submit a planning application within nine months of us acquiring the site and um, also to bring forward detailed applications as quickly as possible. So you can see on this particular slide the various phases. So for example, on, on um, uh, the west, uh, the eastern side, we were able to unlock uh, planning very early on. And um, so from uh, the first purchase of the site to the first start on site, I think we were about two years, weren't we, uh, Louisa? Yeah, March 20. March 20. So within two years of acquiring all the land, we had a developer starting on site for 460 homes. Um, OK, uh, next uh, question. Uh, can you talk to us through any sorts of templates you use for planning, managing and updating, please? Yes, yeah, so uh, this flows from our project execution plan. So we put this in place very early on with our consultants, ACOM. And um, we set this as a template, not only in terms of reporting the governance, so we had standard templates, but also how these templates will be signed off. So I've got it in my, uh, uh, so for example, on, on the, you probably can't see this, but the annex to the project execution plan has a series of what's called work stream sign off objective forms, and then it sets the uh, briefs and each of those then needs to be signed off 
at a project director level and then by the each of the project team levels. So you have a number of forms, standardized forms that the team have to report through and then those templates report back up through the governance in terms of, of an audit, audit and sign off process. So um, it's, it's a very transparent process, the project board. Um, it enables citing not only in terms of cost management, but also complete control of various work streams. Um, uh, next question, our local, local LPA has asked us that we consider working with private landowners for specific uh, allocations uh, within the borough to bring forward a site. They have uh, recommended we look to develop a statement of common ground. Was this also considered for Burgess Hill and did the project team plan and navigate this process? Well, yes, there was a, um, a statement of common ground prepared by the uh, developers. Um, it did say, set out the principles of, of that and it's something that we enshrined in part of our delivery of the project. Uh, so it, that was part of their submissions to the examination process. Uh, and we were, uh, in fact, I chaired a what was called a developer forum, which brought together that statement of common ground. Clearly, when Homes England did step in, we took ownership of that statement uh, post the examination and converted that into our uh, delivery plan, which there was then signed off by the government. So we used a lot of the work that was done by the private promoters in getting the site allocated but then use those as the basis for our delivery plan going forwards. So the lessons learned was really interesting, I'm sure valuable. Thank you. Um, if that isn't part of the organization, if that isn't part of the organization's culture or business as usual, how do we convince people of the value? Um, I can probably pick up on yeah, this a bit if yeah, you want. Um, please, Louisa, yeah. just, just from what I've been doing, in terms of if it isn't part of the cultural BAU, the, the main advantage of it is that it, it, in, a, in essence makes other people's lives easier to learn from where something's worked well rather than start from scratch. So it might not be part of the, the existing culture, but if you can say, right, we've done this here, this has been a success, um, you know, use these templates for um, a consultant or use this, this is the business case we took to Treasury and it was successful you're in, a, in essence start that rather than them starting from scratch or reinventing the wheel you're helping people to make something a success you know by learning from other people's experience so you could sell it in that way you yeah. you you know you're helping someone else really yeah so there's a huge amount of learning but also it's it's it really is you know helping colleagues to do a better you know do it more efficiently more effectively saving money um, and the outcomes for a project like this was speed and pace, but also delivering homes quickly, which is obviously one of our key strategic objectives here. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think if you can sell that as part of your culture going forwards, then there's a lot for uh, to convince your colleagues of the value of these. So next one's from. Did you have to use CPOs in the process of acquiring the land? Um, well, on this project, no, we didn't. Uh, obviously, uh, Homes England does have statutory powers, but um, I think it's fair to say that all of the parties knew that we had those powers to deliver the project if, if it had stalled any further. But I think there was all a recognition that none of the parties were willing or able to take forward the project. I think um, where you have another uh, project, uh, I've been involved in them, then you have to use, uh, look to potentially look to use CPO as a last resort. And sometimes that has to be part of the tools that uh, the public sector need to be uh, considering as part of a delivery program. But on this particular project, it, it was uh, an agreement between all parties that no party could take it forward and that the best uh, a particular organisation in order to commit the resources to take it forward was Homes England. That won't be the same on every project. In fact, we went through an incremental <coughs> stage of assessing who was the right person to uh, deliver it and actually whether we just part played a partnering role in part of the scheme in terms of whether we funded the infrastructure and, and others take forward. So 
working through all those options, we ended up at the final uh, stage uh, and the case that was signed off with where we acquired all the land. But it was an incremental process to look at how the project could be delivered. <coughs> so um, I think we've only got two two minutes left, actually. Um, so uh, Louise, yeah, if you want to do the next, the next question. One? Yeah. Please, so has the areas of commercial delivery been successful or did they need intervention to promote the delivery? So, so far we have um, only marketed one area of commercial land, which is for a neighbourhood centre. Um, within that is also, um, we also uh, will be delivering housing. Um, we we put those out through our um, called DPP3 framework, which a number of developers are on, um, which will be replaced by the DPS framework later in the year. Um, but in answer to your question, they didn't need intervention to promote delivery. We just put them out as a package of housing with commercial land. What we will be doing later this year is putting out a purely commercial land um, with no housing on. So we will we will test then. We, we're currently going to be testing the market, see the interest in that. Um, but we do have a lot of interest in this site, given its um, scale and you know its location. So we don't see there being an issue or requiring specific intervention we're hoping that the market will be will be um, interested anyway so, but we'll know about that a bit more later in the year yeah. um just a few quick other ones really are you able to share any lessons learned specifically around infrastructure contractor procurement i think it's important that um, you do them in partnership um, we're looking at risk and reward structures in our contracts now where um if they deliver undervalue, then they they are incentivized. If they are if they uh, the cost drifts because of their role, then uh, it's the risk sits with them. Um, I think you've got to do as much work as you can to inform the tender. So a lot of due diligence, make sure you've got all the information in place, particularly outline planning or maybe detailed planning. That's helpful for a procure investor procurement, and and don't forget that all contractors are the same. Um, they just uh, just look different, but they are well. They are well versed and sometimes very sort of um, uh, quite uh, uh, um, you know looking for the opportunities to exploit uh, any sort of uh, problems within uh, the pack that you might send them. Um, so I think we're just about running out of time here. We'll be transported back shortly, uh, but I hope you found the session. I'm sorry I've not answered everyone's questions but uh, 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 please uh, thank you very much for your time and I hope you've enjoyed the breakout session. Thank you. So I'd like to welcome everyone back to um, the main room and just whilst people are joining just to highlight you will be sent um, a side deck of all the um, presentations that we've used today and that will include both sets of breakout group slides so if you are in one and not the other you will receive both sets so for our final element today um, i'd like to introduce catherine holmes who is a head of in cities and major conurbations here at homes england and also Juliet Blackburn, Improvement Manager at Wirral Borough, Borough Council, and they're going to give us an insight into the Wirral Left Bank project. We will also have um, time for a short question and answer session, so please do post your questions in the chat throughout. Over to you, Catherine and Juliet. Thank you. Could we have um, the next slide, please? Um, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Juliet Blackburn and I'm a consultant. I've been working with Wirral Council um, over the last 18 months on um, just a really incredibly exciting regeneration programme focused on the, the left bank of the River Mersey. So for those of you that aren't familiar with it, um, that's a picture of, of the Wirral Peninsula. Um, you can see it's very much a game of two halves. Um, with a, a lot of uh, greenbelt running through through the middle. And you can see um, the Birkenhead docks is the, the area sort of to the northwest of the of the peninsula, sorry, northeast of the peninsula, opposite Liverpool, um, Liverpool docks and, and Liverpool. And one of the 
crucial elements of um, the approach that we've taken with colleagues at, at Homes England um, and also the city region as well over the last 18 months is the fact that Wirral um, was firmly on the naughty step with um, MHCLG for a good while about non-delivery of its local plan um, but actually we've really turned that situation around and a desire to go for an urban intensification local plan which we're just working on the, the draft of has been absolutely catalytic um, in in really coming up with a creative and ambitious programme for uh, for the regeneration of, of Birkenhead. Just, um, just so you know, the pen peninsula is, has a population of just over 360,000. Um, and the area that we're looking at in, in Birkenhead um, is, is larger actually than the, the um, footprint of the of Liverpool city. Um, so it's, it really is a project of some significant scale. And as you'll hear through this um, through the slides, Homes England have been absolutely pivotal, um, key, key partner in in shaping this program um, in the last 18 months and I hope we'll continue to be um, a key partner in our delivery. So the next slide please. Gosh you really do feel like Chris Whitty when you say that you just but your brain desperately reaches for words that are different and that's what you always come up with. Um, before I talk about Birkenhead specifically um, just wanted to, to make the point that we we talk about um, the, the left bank of the of the River Mersey um, and we have a comprehensive regeneration programme which stretches all the way from from New Brighton um, down to Rock Ferry. The Birkenhead programme which we'll we'll say some more about is, is definitely the largest of that but actually we have a number of urban centres um, along left bank and we are developing master plans for um, for each of those and I've just put a couple of pictures on the right there um, which it's one of the lovely things actually that has happened about the, the left bank uh, regeneration program it's one of the most encouraging things is that naturally art um, and culture has become a significant part of that and the um the picture at the top is is i love new brighton um i still can't actually believe that's just a painting it looks so real um and the the, the um the picture at the bottom is in new new ferry where again local art um, has been a huge part of that regeneration. So now I'm just going to tell you a bit about the Birkenhead programme. I'm going to set out um, what our ambitions are and then I'm going to hand over to Catherine who's going to tell you about our approach to developing um, partnership over the last over um, the last 18 months. OK, if you want to move on. So why why Birkenhead and why left bank Birkenhead in, in particular. So our vision for the place is the creation of a beautiful waterfront garden city um, on, on the left bank of the River Mersey. It has um, significant potential in terms of brownfield land up to um, 20,000 new homes and, and around 6,000 new homes. Back to the first slides of, the, of this session, this is definitely a portfolio. It's a, it has longevity, it has a series of programmes within it. We're talking at least a 20 to 30 year um, time frame. It's part of the city regions uh, strategy as well. And it has, people have kind of caught the vision that it's a huge opportunity for a really distinctive um, urban offer. As I said at the, in the first slide, we've been um, giving a lot of focus to development of our uh, Wirral local plan with a strong um, shared political commitment to um, urban intensification or really a brownfield first um, option, which is looking at, at focusing that growth on the left bank. We, I mean, obviously, like everywhere across the country, hugely challenging time um, economically over the last year or so. Um, but we've got signs of hope in terms of growth sectors for maritime, modular construction and um, really fantastic creative industries as well. And one of the most significant elements that's a real real uh, bonus for Birkenhead is that we have um, significant development underway. So um, Peel have a programme called Wirral Waters, which itself is a 30 year programme, um, around four billion pounds of, of investment. And it's it's focused on the the, um, the Dockland development, mixed use, um, up to, um, as I said, a 20, 30 year programme there. The council's also formed a 50-50 joint venture with Muse Developments, um, which is called the Wirral Growth Company. And there's a major uh, town centre regeneration programme that's that's um, underway. An urban splash, uh, we're fortunate enough as part of Wirral Waters, are developing a programme um, in, in the Wirral Waters Dockland development as well. Okay, next slide. 
So this is a, an aerial shot of, of Birkenhead. So you can see the Docklands there in the middle. Um, that's the focus of, of Wirral Waters. Um, Birkenhead Park, which was the first public park in the country and was the, was the inspiration for Central Park in, in New York. You can see that there. Um, and also, hopefully you get an idea of the scale of the brownfield land that is available. So we've put there some of the, the ticks, the reasons for, um, for Birkenhead to to feel confident in having this ambitious waterfront garden city vision. Um, there's, the connectivity is superb. Um, if you get on a, a train at Birkenhead uh, Hamilton Square station, you can pop up in Liverpool city centre two, two and a half minutes later. There's three ferry ports, six train stations in there. Availability of sites, as I said, um, my, my previous commission was at South End Council um, and South End it does not have anything like the availability of brownfield development sites that Birkenhead has. Um, but the, the one of the challenges for Birkenhead, unlike South End, is you know, the, is, is the housing viability and the housing market. Um, you can see just there under the word Birkenhead, there's a significant site there which is called Hind Street and that's one of our um, major development sites. We, we intend to develop uh, Hind Street Urban Village there and also right there on, on the waterfront. Um, also in the tick list, you can see that we, we've been successful in securing funding from the government's um, Urban Development Corporation competition. So we've just started the work on that, looking at what's the right delivery vehicle um, for the left bank regeneration. And I'm just going to un under, um, underscore again the fact that we have this shared partnership ambition with Homes England, with Combined Authority, with Metropolitan College, with community groups. Um, and that has been a real kind of boost and, um, and, and momentum over the last year. But there are the challenges of a, a, a significant market failure, significant um, reclamation issues, land assembly challenges, but also how do we balance the kind of long term vision with the need, the more immediate needs of our Birkenhead residents? OK, my uh, next slide is my final slide. Just to give you an idea, again, if you're not familiar, um, that's looking from um, just above Birkenhead Town Centre across the Mersey to the beautiful city of Liverpool. And you can see Birkenhead is blessed with one of the most amazing waterfront views in the world. Um, and you can see there the development sites on the on the right. We've got development sites right on the waterfront. So um, our, our ambition and our vision and our work with Homes England has been how do we take this kind of all these opportunities um, with the long term time scale, how do we shape that into um, a meaningful programme for for delivery? And this is where Homes England have been absolutely pivotal and, and key to working with us in the last 18 months. And Catherine is going to tell you now um, how we've formed that partnership and some of the work that we've done. Thank you. Thank you. So, so as I'm sorry, I have some feedback. Hopefully it's OK for you guys. As Juliet explained, this is a this is a really significant opportunity for all partners within Liverpool City region. And at Homes England, we have been working with the Combined Authority for probably about 18 months to two years now to develop a pipeline of uh, residential opportunities. And Left Bank has emerged as one of the priorities within that pipeline. So this is a project which is firmly owned by the local authority. It's it's rural council's ambition um, and rural council have done you know, a lot of that early work. But as with many other local authority partners, they um, probably fair to say they had a lack of capacity if we go back about 12, sort of 18 months ago. And whilst there was this, you know, tremendous opportunity and tremendous ambition, actually there were lots of different conversations going on. So the council was speaking to the combined authority, they were speaking to Homes England, the, the developers that um, Juliet referenced, Peel and so on, they were having separate conversations. So it was it was recognised that there was a need to pull all of this together so we could make some sort of meaningful progress. And that's where Homes England came into play. So what we did was to sort of gather all of this expertise, the ambition, the ideas, the shared intel across the shareholders and try to apply some sort of structure to the project. What we did was to suggest to the council that they, rather than have lots of different meetings and lots of different forums for sort of um, airing views, might pull that together into one working group, essentially. So what we did was we established a programme team. That team is 
uh, it reflects all of the partners' ambitions, the combined authority, the local authority, Homes England, it's represented by, we, we try to keep it relatively small, so, you know, in sort of practical terms, there were a lot of us involved in this project, still are, but in order to get the most out of any uh, working group or any project team, we've tried to limit the numbers of, of those attending. So we, have, we try to have about two representatives of each of the key stakeholders, and then we bring in others as and when required. So on occasions we've had Muse come in to talk to us, we've had Peel come in um, to share their ideas and so on. We do a bit of what we're doing now, a bit of a presentation, a bit of question and answer session, just to get us sort of to that next milestone. The programme uh, team reports into a board. Again, the board is represented by the three key stakeholders, the CA, ourselves uh, and the council, with the council chairing that board. I actually chair the programme team and we run it, you know, for those sort of uh, Prince 2 enthusiasts among you, we run it really quite formally. We have highlight reports, we have a programme uh, with terms of reference, we have the risk register. So we've we've taken all of those conversations um, from the sort of two years ago and we've applied some sort of structure to a monthly meeting. It doesn't stop those ad hoc meetings taking place, but what it does stop is sort of us hearing third hand about conversations that have been had because we all come together on a monthly basis. So the roles and responsibilities of each party are now clearly articulated in a sort of a terms of reference. We have a programme which we update on a monthly basis. It's essentially, you know, I would like to say it's to hold people to account, but that sounds perhaps a, a bit too aggressive. It's, it's not really to do that, but it is to ensure momentum. And it's also to give direction because this is a huge, this is a huge project. We are, you know, we've heard from, um, Mike and Ian and Ken about projects that are perhaps more mature than Left Bank. We are only a couple of years into what is essentially a 15, 20 year programme. So we need to make sure that we know what we're doing in sort of in that sort of next three month period. It's in, it's in it, you know, to use a phrase that's been used by the, the chief exec of the CA, it's an elephant and we're, we're, we're eating bite sized pieces. We're just looking at the next three months in this in order to um, maintain momentum. Yes, we have a PID because there are lots of different angles to this project, so we pulled it all together in one. And yes, we do as, uh, assess risks and issues. A lot of the risks are around funding, they're around lack of capacity. You know, we're not into the detail of the project yet, so we're not looking at cost escalation or at anything of that side, at that scale just yet. We have We've had to look at uh, budget and resource requirements again, because people requirements are really important at this stage of the project. We need to bring in the right expertise at the right time. It's important that we don't bring people around the table when actually they're sitting at a meeting, but don't get any value from that meeting. We don't add anything to it. We've got limited financial resources as well, pre-development funding across the board. So we have to spend that wisely and make sure we are being really effective with those Ardell uh, resources that we have. We need to ensure that all of the stakeholders are considered and have an opportunity to um, really to share the information that they have to hand because there's been lots done across the within the red line boundary over the years and it's important that we're not duplicating information, we're not doing anything that's unnecessary. And all of this, you know, sort of from a Homes England perspective, being a little selfish, you know, why are we involved in this? Well, it's a tremendous opportunity. It will de deliver homes of scale, but also we are looking for investable propositions in this. You know, we have big budgets, we have big programmes, we can help accelerate delivery. So we're looking to work with partners to shape the ambition and to better articulate what the projects are and the tasks are within that delivery strategy. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the sort of this is the, the governance structure that we have established and we've done this through COVID as well. So it's not it, I think we've probably found a rhythm now and we're we're pretty good at the meetings and you know we, we all 
respect the protocols and so on. But you'll appreciate yourselves that we've brought in people that have never met each other sort of physically. We've brought them into a team structure and actually it's it's worked pretty well. So what we have is the board there that we just explained. Again, they meet on a monthly basis. The left bank programme team meets monthly, but it um, it also has separate meetings that, that are required just to keep different parts of the project uh, running at different times. And within there, you see sort of what uh, Juliet explained, the sort of seven regen areas that we are focusing on in taking this project forward. And if we go back sort of 15, 18 months ago, we knew what the overall ambition was, but we probably none of us were able to explain what the phasing of that project was. And what we've done over the last sort of six to nine months is look to see where we start with this. What, you know, what are the bits that we start to look at now in terms of earlier wins? There are no early wins on this. It's a, it's a huge complex project, but where what might we start to really make some impact? So uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So MPP is a, a newish part of the organisation. We've been um, probably in place for about just over a year at Homes England. That's the markets, partners and places uh, team, and that's the team that I sit in. So what we have done is to do this early work with, with Juliet and, and council partners. We've done that sort of early uh, diagnostic. We've identified the opportunity and identified the challenge. Now we're in that period of looking to see what the potential interventions might be. We know what the challenge is um, within left bank. There's fragmented land ownership, we've got contamination, we've got low land values, a lack of investment over the years, poor infrastructure and so on. So with those sort of very broad, high level challenges identified, what we need to do as we go forward is to sort of broker those discussions with the right people um, in order to better articulate how we start to move this forward. And what we did um, last year, i.e. the year just ending March, is that we put some financial resources in along with the combined authority. We put some pre-development funding in to really take a consultant on board, again, filling that, that skills and that capacity gap that was obvious to better understand where we would start on this, what the phase one might look like and what the tasks within the phase one um, would be in order for us to move uh, you know, forward on this. And we talked about decan strategies. We talked about land assembly strategies and looking at remediation, refreshing SIs and so on. And a lot of that work is ongoing now. And that um, is being led in part by local authority staff and in part by ourselves. We feed into the briefs. We feed into the um, consultant uh, reports back so that we are an intelligent client. But what we're also doing internally is to bring in colleagues from the right teams within Homes England because having identified that opportunity up front it's important that we bring in the right people at the right time. We've said this a couple of times and I know it's been it's been said by other speakers in the day, but this is all about having the right resource and the people working together and us all really collaborating. And I, you know, I have to say that the council have been really receptive to our support on this one. They've been a really good uh, partner to work with and there have been very few challenges while the council are have had an eye originally on their local plan and we had an eye on developing the project. Actually, what we found is those two objectives have come quite nicely together and we're, and we're really working very well at the moment. So with a sort of a phase one identified, which if we've gone back to the earlier slides, which is around Hamilton Park and Victoria Studios, with an opportunity of over 5,000 homes in that phase one. We are now, as MPP within Homes England, bringing in other colleagues. So we're working with colleagues in the economics team to define um, the, the opportunity and the financial ask within a phase one. We started uh, citing papers, so a strategic outline case, just to socialise this opportunity with other parts of the organisation. And we're actually very soon um, to be commissioning some 
economics support externally to look at a strategic outline business case. Now, this is not to raise hopes that this is something that we can do on every project, because of course we can't, we've all got limited resource, but this left bank project has been identified as a priority by partners within the Liverpool city region. So we are pooling that resource to help accelerate the, de the delivery strategy. We're working with our infrastructure grants team to look at what programme and what delivery mechanism might best suit any infrastructure requirement on the phase one particularly because we know there is some commonality in the requirements between the two regen areas that we've identified. So how do we how do we best employ the tools that are available to us at the moment in terms of um, investment, loan investment and so on? How do we bring in the expertise from the private sector and drill down into those constraints and costs that have already been identified to better understand what the what the real ask is of governments and you know ask of partners is we are in that we're in that stage at the moment and then of course there are, are programs that most of you on the call will be familiar with the ahp and so on which is live now that that is sort of business as usual if you like so as we look at the left bank in its entirety if we think there is an opportunity there for a strategic partnership or for a new investor partner we are bringing in the affordable homes and um, the affordable growth team to further work that proposition up. Uh, next slide, please. So what's next for us? Well, having identified the phase one, having got the sort of the architecture around the project team, so that governance structure there, what we will be doing going forward is to test the indicative ask that we identified a couple of months ago. So it's a sort of a, a deep dive on the costs that potentially have been put to us in terms of bringing forward the phase one. We are firming up the programme of activity. So a lot of the governance structure that I showed you before has now gone down a level so that we have uh, work streams within that sort of programme team structure. And those work streams are now picking up some of the tasks that we identified earlier as essential to moving forward the phase one. That's the sort of the technical due diligence, the land assembly strategies and so on that we know will be required in order to uh, really sort of help us develop what is it, a dock side um, site in this first phase. We're looking at the overall funding strategy because this will no doubt require a cocktail of funding from a number of different um, bodies. And as sort of, although we don't want to think about strategy and tactics, it is really important that where we identify a challenge and potentially a funding intervention to um, support that challenge, that we understand that those two funding pots work well together. So if we're using brownfield funding and we're using, for example, AHP, do they align? Are we, you know, are we able to count outputs and so on? It's it's a sort of it sounds as if something that comes much further down the line, but actually we're having to address it now because for many of you that are working in local authorities, you know that you're trying to, you know, deal with towns fund, future high streets, AHP, brownfield. Uh, LNIF, et cetera, there are a lot of funds out there and we need to make sure that we're not tripping ourselves up or doing something that we will be detrimental to future plans. So that's something that we've just started to look at. And then also that multifunctional team that we identified earlier and said, bring the, the right people in at the right time, don't waste time, that we are now at that point where we need to pull those teams together and we know that we need to sort of start looking in earnest at how we how we refer tasks over to other parts of the organisation so that they can run with a lot of this work that we previously teed up. Um, a massive thank you to all of our speakers today, uh, Juliet from, for joining us from uh, Wirral Council, the behind the scenes team for helping run this session and finally to you for your attendance and participation. And we hope to see you at um, a future session. Thank you.